We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, open up there. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 22. This is the calling of the first disciples that have entitled this message, Fishers of Men. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 12. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. May God add blessing to the reading and doing of his holy word. Here's my quick outline. When you go fishing with Jesus, number one, trouble is going to come your way. When you go fishing with Jesus, you have to go where the people are. When you go fishing with Jesus, you have to tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And finally, when you go fishing with Jesus, you begin to do what Jesus did. You make fishers of men. So an easier way is, one, trouble coming, two, go, three, tell, four, do. Trouble's coming, go, tell, do. We're going to go through that today in the next moments together. John baptized Jesus in the Jordan. We, We read about that a few weeks ago. This was inaugurating his earthly ministry. All of prophecy came together in that one moment when Jesus was baptized, inaugurating his ministry on earth. And then Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. There he prayed and fasted and went through great tribulation with Satan. And then now that leads us to here. Trouble is going to come your way. What happened here? The Bible says that John the Baptist was placed in prison. Why was he in prison? Because he said what God put on his heart. And there are times that you have to say something to somebody that they do not want to hear. And when you do, trouble is a coming. John said to Herod, it's not lawful. You've taken your brother's wife to be your wife. That's called adultery. Herod got so upset he wanted to kill John the Baptist, but he couldn't because why? The people thought he was a prophet. But then he gave, Herod gave a great feast for his wife on her birthday, and the daughter came in and danced, and it was so pleasing to Herod that he said, you can ask for anything you want, even up to half the kingdom. And she went and consulted with her mother, and they didn't like John the Baptist, and they came back with the answer, we want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And because of all of his guests and the dignitaries, he didn't want to be embarrassed, and so he went in and had John executed, martyred for his faith. So he's following Jesus. John the Baptist is doing exactly what God wants him to do, and his head is taken off. His head is lifted. In this world, Jesus said, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Following Jesus is not for sissies. It is hard to follow Jesus. I don't want to disillusion any of you. I don't want to make you think that once you follow Jesus, you're going to get a gift certificate from someplace and everything is going to have a party for you. Yes, you'll have a party in heaven, but on this earth, until Christ comes back, Satan is working against all of God's kids. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. That was in John 15, 20. Did they persecute Jesus? And they'll persecute us. Back up one here. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Now, when I first read that, I thought Jesus withdrew like he retreated. He backed up. He, he was trying to get away from the heat. He was trying to get away from the persecution. But that's not what it means at all. As I dug deeper into the scripture, it's very interesting. Jesus is down the far left there. You maybe can't read it. It says Nazareth, the bottom left. 
And Jesus went up to Cana for his first miracle. And then he went over to Tiberias and he went all the way up to Capernaum. That's the Sea of Galilee. It's about at its widest point at the top. It's about seven and a half miles wide. Its length is about 13 and a half miles long. So it's not a great big place, but it's where they went to fish. And Jesus is now gathering around this. And you have to know that this is called the land of, in the, in the Galilees, of the Gentiles. So Jesus goes right to where the trouble is the hottest. He goes to the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, and that's where the heat is hottest. Herod knows right where he is, and Herod's probably monitoring everything he's doing. And what is Jesus going to say now that we've killed John the Baptist? So Jesus doesn't withdraw from the heat. He moves toward the heat because that's what God has called him to do. So trouble's coming. You're going to face trouble. Number two, you have to go where the people are. That's so important. You have to go. We have to go where the people are. Jesus did not stay in heaven and holler down, go to church, 9.30 for Sunday school. You can go on Wednesday night if you're really committed. Jesus came down to earth from heaven. He came to where we are. And we have to leave this great place called church as we gather. We need to gather. Please come and gather. Gather every week. Be strengthened through worship, through Bible study, through fellowship. We need this. Don't quit coming to church. But this isn't the goal. The goal isn't to be in church. The goal is to be the church. We've got to go where the people are. I need to go where the people are that don't know Jesus yet. Verses 13 through 16. It's so interesting how Matthew puts this. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. Capernaum. This is by some of the Gentiles. By the lake and the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. You know, there's the, the two kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. There are 12 tribes or 12 brothers of Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. And the, the ten brothers that lived to the north, it was called Israel. The two brothers that were in the south, it was called the land of Judea. You had Benjamin there as well in the southern kingdom. So Jesus goes up to the northern kingdom where some Gentiles are by the lake of Galilee. And Jesus, he, lived, he left where he was and he lived in this area and he loved those folks. That's part of what it means to go, you leave your comfort zone and you go and you live among them and you love them. That's Jesus' example. You say, Pastor, what are you saying? Pack up my bag and move somewhere? Well, if God's calling you to full-time missions, you better go. If God's calling you to full-time ministry, you better go. If God's calling you to plant a church out of this place, come and talk to us, but you must go in time. You can't stay if God is calling you to do something. You must go and do that. We can't hold on to people here and say, well, no, you're ours. It'll hurt our attendance. Hogwash. If God is calling you to go do ministry, you better go. And I wonder if God would call some of you to full-time missions, if God would call some of you to full-time ministry, if God would call you to plant a church one of these days. You need to be listening to God. You have to leave your comfort zone, go and live somewhere else, and love those people. I uh, heard about uh, our, our folks that went to Africa, and they got to meet our Lynx prayer partners, Ronald and Shelly Miller. Well, Ronald wasn't there, but Shelly was and her kids. They're in Swaziland, Africa. Those folks heard God say, go. They left everything, and they went, and they are serving Jesus over in Africa. There are some that do missions on a regular basis, and there's a group of them right there. It's a great picture of our team. And Church of the Nazarene, Tonga. Revival services are getting ready to start, I think they said, next week. That's wonderful. Built a church. Church there. People are going to come. People are going to get saved because some people went. Some people went from Sherwood, Arkansas and went to Africa and built a church. People will get saved because of this ministry effort. People will be sanctified through this ministry effort. People in Africa will be called to full-time ministry because this group went. If they hadn't gone, maybe somebody else would have built the church, but they would have missed the blessing. 
There are people outside this church who do not yet know Jesus. And unless you go to them, they will never hear the gospel. They will never be saved. And they will miss heaven for all eternity. Do we really believe that God wants everybody to be saved? God is not willing that any should perish. Went to a great study yesterday on a training with uh, Reverend Mark Bain. And he's, uh, he is now the director of evangelism in North America. He was a youth pastor in the 80s. Uh, down at, on Main Street, North Little Rock First Church. He left there and went and pastored, 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 became a DS, and then now he's the director of missions over North America. And he is on fire for God. I was like, how does he have so much energy? He sleeps about four hours a night. And he just wakes up and he eats, drinks, sleeps Jesus. And I was inspired by his intentionality to reach out to lost people. It convicted me, folks. Your pastor got really convicted sitting there listening to this guy, this man of God, speak about reaching out to the lost. So what do we do with that? We obey the Lord. You will have something that God will ask you to do. I will have something that God will ask me to do. I'll come worship here and preach, do my best with you. But when I'm not here, I am looking to be led by the Spirit in conversations, be led by the Spirit to talk to people about Jesus. We need to be doing that, folks. We can tend, I can tend, I don't know about you, I can tend to get far too quiet about what God is doing in my life, thinking I've got to be politically correct. I've said to my daughter, I, I said, you know, think about if, if Jesus took over your body and he spoke through you in your school. Like Jesus inhabits you, he takes over, you are now possessed in the right way, by the Holy Spirit. And you're going to say and do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you. It's like Jesus is in your body and you're walking around, but it's Jesus in you. What is Jesus going to say in your school? What is Jesus going to say to your teachers? What is Jesus going to say to those friends who are doing good things and bad things? What will Jesus say? Now that's up to you because that's the, that's the relationship we have with God. And he'll speak something to you different than me, but we've got to obey the Spirit. There are, there are 30,000 people in Sherwood, and I don't think all of them go to church. I don't think all of them have a relationship with Jesus. In fact, if all 30,000 people went to church on a Sunday, I don't know that we'd have enough churches in town to hold them all. Wouldn't that be great if all the churches were full in Sherwood? How is that going to happen? Well, you're going to get a really good preacher, and he's going to preach great messages on Sunday morning, and they're all just going to flood in here. I wish. No. It's going to take the work of us together, staff and laity together, to harvest what God has put out there for us. Are you willing to do that, church? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm so glad you're saved. I'm so glad you're here. I want you to come every week. I'm so glad you're here. And I'll shake your hand. I'll hug your neck. I'll, I'll applaud you. I'm glad you're here. But we are here to be encouraged so that we might go out to do what Jesus did, to seek and to save that which is lost. How lost were you when you were lost? How desperate were you before you came to Christ? Any of you like, you know, your head's in a stool and you have, you're throwing up, you know, all night drinking and drunk, you have a hangover and you have your head in a commode and then somebody came and they told you about Jesus and you're like, I'm tired of having my head in a commode. I want a better life. And you give your life to Christ and everything changes. It may not be overnight, but it changes. And it's different. And now you think, boy, I'm so glad I don't have my head in a commode. But you've got a neighbor whose head is in a commode. Who will do for him what somebody did for you? The pastor, of course. Well, yes, your pastor will do that. I will do my redeemed best, but it's all of us together to harvest what God has put out there for us. The fruits, the fruit of the righteousness of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is wise. Paul said to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. 
Jesus left Nazareth, the comfort there of his hometown, and he went and lived in Capernaum where the people were, the lost people, the dirty people, the Gentiles. He went to them. This is the third time Jesus has moved. He was born in Bethlehem, then he moved to Egypt, Africa, then to Nazareth, now moving to Capernaum. Jesus is on the move. And those who are following Jesus, you're on the move. You can't stay static. You can't stay the same. If your prayer life is the same and your Bible reading is the same as it was 20 years ago and there's no change, no improvement, so trouble's coming, you have to go and you have to tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. We're not talking about watering down the gospel when we go out to people, but it's being wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus says a lot of hard things to people. I just picked out four of them. Four hard things. Jesus says things to people that you think, Jesus, you know, you probably could have won them over better if you'd said that a little nicer. Or Jesus, you need to remember your audience who you're speaking to. But Jesus spoke what God put on his heart. And we've got to do the same thing. Here, just quickly, how about this one? Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And you read that, you're like, whew, boy, that's something you want to preach on. That'll run people off. That's what Jesus said. So somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm thinking about leaving my wife. You know, God's given me peace about this. I can leave my wife and go have an affair with somebody else. And you can say, no, God hates divorce. Oh, I can't believe you tell me that. Who are, who are you? Mr. Know-it-all, Mr. Perfect, don't judge me, you Christian. Hey, I'm just telling you what Jesus says. You call yourself a Christian? Yeah, I call myself a Christian and God's given me peace about this. Has he really? Are you just tricking yourself? Are you telling yourself what you want to hear? See, you've got to tell people the hard things. Jesus did. How about this? If anyone comes to me, Jesus said, and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's a hard saying. There, there are not three ways to get into heaven. There is one way to heaven. That's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will miss heaven forever. You'll be in a place called hell, and God doesn't want you to go there. Nobody in this place wants you to go to hell. But if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you will go to hell. That's a hard teaching. How about this in Matthew 5, 48? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Oh. Okay, who said that? Jesus hard saying. He said it. You can dig that out. There's lots of great rich meaning in this verse. You can dig that out. We are a holiness church and we believe that God can perfect our hearts through his grace. He doesn't clean you up 95%. He cleans you up 100%. You continue to work with him and walk with him. He keeps cleaning. You keep walking. His light keeps cleansing. His light keeps cleansing. The blood of Jesus cleanses you. You've got to keep walking. How about this one? Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Whoa. I was talking to somebody, a, a Christian, been a Christian for six, seven decades, I don't know. And this person had some wrong ideas and saying, you know, I'm just going to do this. I don't really care about this. And I said, I said, can I tell you something really hard? And they said, yeah. And I said, is it worth doing this thing you want to do so you can go to hell? And this person said, no, I want to go to heaven. I said, well, if God says, don't do these things and you continue to do them and you don't care, you're not listening to God. You might find yourself in darkness and then outer darkness. And that strong word, and I said it just like that. I was kind. I wasn't like, oh, you're going to hell. I didn't say that. I just said, is it worth going to hell over? And this person said, no. Sometimes we have to say the hard thing to people. With love, with love. People on earth hate to hear the word repent. Those in hell wish they could hear it just once more. Mm -hmm. All right. Trouble's coming. Go, tell. And number four, you begin to do what Jesus did. You make fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. You go, I'm not a fisher of men. I don't know what to do, pastor. What am I supposed to do if I'm going to go out and make fishers of men? Jesus will make you a fisher of men. He will make you a fisher of men. You've got to spend time with him. 
You've got to pray, talk with him, read the scriptures, come to church. He will make you into a fisher of men. There are some of you that have a wonderful skill of woodworking, and I admire you. Some of you can build things, you can put things together, and it just amazes me. Some of you have been doing it for years and years and years. You can see something in your mind's eye of how to put those boards together and make it just come together. I am amazed by that talent. Now, I don't think all of you were born with that. I think you had to work to develop that talent. Some of you had to throw away some boards that you, that you miscut. My, my dad always used to say, you know, Noel, you cut it twice and it's still too short. Uh, and so I never was good at carpentry, but I'm telling you that when you put your mind to something, you can become better at it. Jesus says, I will make you a fisher of men. It's his job. He will make you into a fisher of men. He took some raw material of Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and he made them, after three and a half years and being filled with the Holy Spirit, he made them into fishers of men. <clears throat> All right. Um, I want to try something with you. I need your help. I want you to stand to your feet if you've been a Christian longer than three and a half years. Would you stand up? Stand up. If you've been a Christian longer than three and a half years. Okay. Okay. Wow, that's more than I thought. Um, I'm just telling you that Jesus sent some men out into the world that had less training than you do, and they turned the world upside down. Do you think we're ready? Do you think Jesus could use us to make a difference? All right, be seated. We're almost down here. We're almost down here. Thank you for obliging on that. Follow me and I will make you fishers for men. How do you know you're making disciples? How do you know? You go, well, I'm going to church. I pay my tithe. I, um, I'm nice to that, that wife that God gave me and those kids. How do you know you're making disciples? Well, I come to church. Great. Well, I did. Great. How did the disciples know that they were really making disciples? <laughs> I know it's, this is not rocket surgery. That's what my brother always says. I know it's rocket science. He always says rocket surgery. This is not rocket surgery. How do you know you're making disciples? You've got to be with people. You've got to interact with people, lost people. You're talking to others about the Bible. You're not talking about Democrats, Republicans, Independents. Oh, Democrats, Republicans. Oh, let's fight. Come on. And I'm going to tell them the right way so they can be a better disciple. Eh. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus talked about things of heaven. How do you know you're making disciples? You're talking to people about the Bible, not your opinions. How about you're lifting the burdens of others? Jesus went around lifting the burdens of others. He discipled them by lifting their burdens. Number three, you're sharing with others what God puts on your heart. The easy things and the difficult things. You're sharing with them what God puts on your heart. You're caring more about the needs of others. I love when I come home and my daughter has the channel set for me that I like and my wife has the meal cooked and I go in and they, oh, father, and they take off my shoes and they rub my feet and they fan me and they, how was your day? Is there anything we can do for you? Oh, holy father. I wish. <laughs> my, my family, they're very kind to me. I'm not putting them down at all. That's not what it's about. It's about what can I do to serve those around me? How can I lift the burden? Sometimes I'll say, she's in there, she's cooking in the kitchen. I'll say, how can I help you? Not yet. I'll call you when I'm ready for you. She cooks the whole meal and then come and eat. I'm like, that was easy. I'll help all you need right here at the meal table. There are I'll ask her that. But the thing is, we, 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 it's not about me. You're discipling others by your example. Students, quit saying, Mom and Dad, give me more money. Dad, do this. Mom, do this. How about this? Mom and Dad, how can I serve you? See, they're going to see something different in you, and you're discipling with your life, with your words, with your attitude. It goes a long way. <laughs> mission. What is the mission? Think about it. What is our mission? Come to church. No. That's just part of it. We come here to get refueled, and we go back out 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them and teaching them and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. Church, we've got to be the church. I've said to you before, we don't go to the airport to shake hands with people and then go home. This group that traveled 18 hours in the air, I guess it was. You didn't go to Little Rock to depart for your Africa trip. You didn't go and drop your bags off then come back home. No, you, you went to the airport to make your connecting flight to wherever it was, down in maybe Atlanta, and then off to Africa. We don't come to church and then go, hi, 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 and then we go home. Come back to church, oh, hi, 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 and then go back home. Go back to church, hi, hi. We come to get refueled through Sunday school, through worship. We need to be, please come to church, but then keep moving with God as he leads you. Be the church. Don't just go to church. Be the church. Who is God putting on your mind that you need to talk to? Who is God putting on your mind that you need to talk to? There are people all around us. We've got to be the church. There's our outline. Trouble's coming. Doesn't matter. Go. Tell. Do. Keep doing this. This is making disciples. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I don't know how, pastor. Neither did I. Jump in. Let Jesus lead you through other people, through his word, through his spirit. There's so much I want to say on this, but I want to make sure that God is speaking what He wants this morning. God loves us, and He wants us to share that love with those who do not yet know His love. That's our job. I was talking to a a young man. He was in his teens, And he was telling me about how that when he'd go to school, he didn't know sometimes what to say. Somebody would say something offhand, off color, and he wasn't sure how to respond to that. And and he went home and 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 he said, Dad, these things happen at school. I mean, people say perverted things at school. They talk about girls in a bad way, bad cuss words. They're cheating all the time on tests and stealing homework. And I don't know what to do sometimes, but, but Dad, this little boy, this teenager told me, But dad, here's what I do. When I'm in those situations, I always think, what would dad do if he were here? (laughs) Now, if you've been blessed with a godly father, you can say that same thing. What would my dad do in this situation? What, What would my dad do? And even what's better than that, if you can get even on top of this is, what would Jesus of Nazareth do if he was in this situation right now? There are people all around who don't yet know Jesus. Who's going to reach them? Who's going to reach them? I'm not saying go out and stand on a corner with a bullhorn. I'm not saying, I'm saying in your daily living, as you're walking, talking, breathing, that the influence of Jesus is so shining through you that others are one to him. Your life would be winsome to him. Favorite picture there of Jesus reaching out to us. He's walking by. Would you come? Would you come and follow me? Epiphany is the great light shines down from heaven. Oh, Jesus is here today and he's saying, church, come and follow me and I will make you a fisher of men.